quite well known for walking around with this brain. It's traveled with me to many countries and continents. And what I like is for, I suppose, people to have the experience that I had when I first saw a brain in a jar. It's kind of a really interesting moment to think, wow, this is one part of this powerhouse of what it means to be a thinking, feeling, creating human being. And it's this crazy thing that we really know not very much about. Of course, there's been a lot of advances over the last decades, and particularly with the advent of neuroimaging techniques where we can study the live brain but there's still so much that we don't know, and consciousness is another topic as well. Do we overestimate or underestimate our brains? Probably both. We overestimate in terms of believing what our brain tells us, <laughs> which can be problematic in many cases but we underestimate its potential, and particularly the potential that can come from training it. We, we think about going to the gym and training our bodies. I mean, we're obsessed with going to the gym and training our physical body, but we don't really do very much to train our brain. I think there are multiple ways that you can train the brain, and so, for me, the place where I'm most interested in training the brain is training the attention networks of the brain. This is particularly important in our modern culture, where our attention is really hijacked by multimedia, by the pace of life. And it's news to many people that we can train various uh, faculties of our attention. So we can train ourselves to notice how the aperture of our attentional focus narrows and widens. <coughs> and we can then use that function more flexibly, knowing when is it important for me to really narrow the focus, when is it important for me to really widen the focus. Just like we do with the eye, or with a camera, we can do that with our internal attention, adjusting the aperture of what we focus on. When we're working particularly on creating, there's, there is this movement where we, we might really zoom in and we might really want high quality, sustained, focused attention. But anybody that's experienced a kind of writer's block or a creative block maybe recognizes that there's a moment where you're just kind of stuck with this narrow focus <laughs> and the, the time is ticking and, and the words are not getting written. And what often helps there is things like going for a walk, taking a shower, because then you're releasing the lens of attention and it's becoming wider and broader and you're feeling the wind on your face, you're feeling the shower on your skin, you're smelling the, the, you know, the body wash or the shampoo that you're using. So you're widening and loosening the lens of attention. And then it's often when you do that, then the genius idea, oh, of course, it's, it's that, you know, that's what I'm gonna, um, that, then I'm gonna narrow again. And so if I was training somebody, then what I would say is build in, build into your creative process, moments when you're really tight with your focus and moments when you're more open with your focus, because that will probably increase the chance of, of being able to, to allow those ideas to emerge, um, kind of increasing that creative genius moments. This thing is, constantly full of information from our body, 
constantly. I mean, even just the basics of me maintaining a posture is taking up huge amounts of brain. Um, I'm also on a chair that's moving, so I'm really like aware that I'm sensing kind of balance and posture, trying not to move around. Uh, there's an awareness of, you know, maybe feeling a bit nervous or, or kind of sensations in the body. But mostly people are very much up in their head in the thinking part of, of the brain. Uh, what's referred to as the default mode network, thinking about stuff, remembering, planning, imagining, uh, thinking about ourselves, our personal narrative. And it's nice to spend time there, but it's only such a small portion of our, of our sensory experience. And mind is also like so tricky it can trick us so easily, it can delude us so easily. And, and there's something to be gained by dropping into the body, inviting the, the body to have its turn at sharing its wisdom with us, whether that's a feeling or maybe the body is telling us that we need to take a break from sitting at the computer <laughs> trying to write something for five hours. Maybe it's responding to the body's needs, you know, uh, hunger, needing a drink of water, you know, basic needs and, and care of the body. Um, but it's also a very rich source of data in the creative process, I, I believe. I often encourage the people that I work with to become a scientist of their own experience. So we're quite conditioned to think, oh, well, I've got to write something, so I'm going to sit down at the computer or I'm going to be with my notepad and I, I need to kind of come up with ideas. And, and I would encourage people to explore and experiment. You know, what are the postures for you that support your creative process? Is it sitting in a chair? Is it on a stool? Is it at a desk? What are the environments that support your creative process? Is it in the library? Is it sitting under a tree with your notepad? Is it on the train? Is it in a busy environment? Is it in a quiet environment? Where is it that you find your writing flow? And for many really creative people, what I, what I notice in myself also is that it really helps me to change my environment. So if I'm getting stuck working in the library, then I go and take my laptop to the coffee shop. Uh, and if I'm getting stuck there, then I go and sit on a bus with my notepad, and then I come back and I'm in the library with the laptop, and then I go back to the coffee shop and I'm making voice notes. So it's kind of like mixing up the media and the places and the environments where you're doing your work because that really stimulates the brain and the body. But we need to find our own ways. But I think for the younger generation, uh, their brains are different. Yeah, the digital natives, their, their brains are totally different than ours. And, and I would encourage them to, to move around and to see what works for them. You know, one, one school of thought says, um, fundamentally digital natives, which means people that have grown up in the time pretty much of like the internet and the smartphone. Uh, digital natives fundamentally have brain networks, particularly attention networks that have been shaped and sculpted by the digital environment. And that makes sense because the brain is highly plastic, the attention network particularly is highly plastic. So anything that is working on our attention or impacting on our attention, it, it's highly likely that it's, it's shaped the brain in a slightly different way. So the pessimists will say things like, you know, young people can't pay attention, they can't sit still, they can't consume any media that's more than three minutes long or even like TikTok, <laughs> 15 seconds. Yeah, they're constantly being bombarded with information. Uh, the processing is superficial. 
that's that's one complaint that there's a a kind of very superficial processing of a huge array of data but not really thinking about it properly my more optimistic side says but perhaps these are brains that are being prepared for the challenges that we don't yet know about as adults because the world is like this now and actually maybe it's our brains that are not adapted <laughs> to the challenges of creating and sculpting what this new world looks like where we are interacting with technology so you know we, we need to kind of look at both sides of it I mean, m with my clinical psychology hat on, you know, one of the issues about a, a kind of floppy attention network is the attention network intersects with the emotion regulation. So what I found with working with young people, when we train attention, actually it gives them greater capacity to regulate their emotions, which seems to be quite important because struggles with emotions and mental health is, is affecting a lot of young people at the moment and there could be there could be some some link there you mentioned something that i wrote down and this the body is important when words are hard to find yes. and that makes me think that we wanted to stand yes. and do something about our body yes absolutely although you find your words easily but <laughs> <laughs> so the body is important when we struggle to find the words. And I suppose at the moment for many people, it's hard to find the words or even the feelings around what's happening in the world, kind of this sense of confusion and loss and challenges and, you know, what are we doing? And so this is a movement that I sometimes offer I use it both as an exploration and also as an invitation to let the body speak and to let the emotions flow through. So lifting the arms up is an invitation to say, allow, allow what's there. Opening. Opening the heart, creating space, saying, come on, I can feel. And the mind, of course, can open much wider than my physical body, but my body is helping my mind. And then with all that pain and loss and feelings and confusion, and embrace compassion. It's okay, even though it's not okay. Final part, find the earth, find the soles of the feet. Know that the earth supports us no matter what. Then you might just warm up the heart or just give yourself a little hug. And these seem maybe like silly things to do, um, but when we join the mind and the body and the movement and the heart. We feel more agency even when we feel like we've got no control. You know, what, what, where is my power in this world where I feel so helpless? The power is in my choice to open my heart and be, be with courage and, and kindness and compassion and curiosity i mean i can't what, el what else can i do i can do those things and they're really 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 powerful so this opening movement can serve a variety of functions i think the first one is opening to the fear 
of the challenges, but in terms of the technical aspects of story writing, I might use this exercise to just invite myself to become more aware of what's around my initial thoughts and my initial impressions. So often when I use this movement, if I've got a particular problem that I'm working with or a question that I'm working with, one of the things that often comes is I get more information about the problem. And very often I discover the place where I was kind of fixated and stuck is not the place at all that I need to be exploring. So we maybe think about screenwriters who are, for example, developing a character. And they may have kind of a particular sort of thought track and attention track in terms of their development of the character. And this sort of a movement could be used to just say, but what else is there? What else is there? Bring that character to mind and body using the memory, enriching the memory around the character formation, and then going into this movement to say, okay, but what else, what else could be there? Here is what I think it is, here is the possibility of it, much more. And so then there's a listening to the body, there's a noticing what the mind does. So that might be one suggestion that I would have for screenwriters. And of course, if we go to nature to do these practices, then we're also really stimulating the brain in a particular way. There's some research that shows that spending time in nature and looking around in the natural environment restores and resets the brain's attention network. So if you're getting your head into the screen and you're typing and you're, you're getting a bit tight around things, A, go for a walk, which many people know is a good idea, but you know, if you can do this as well under a tree, <laughs> you know, really nurturing and nourishing the brain to help your imagination. In the brain, that's the default mode network, we call it, and it's got regions uh, kind of in the frontal lobe, what we call the medial frontal lobe, and the posterior. So there's a network here that's actually all about storytelling. Mostly it's concerned with our own story, <laughs> um, but it's also concerned with things like theory of mind, thinking about other people's minds, beliefs, desires, and intentions. And so if you want to try and map that, that landscape, which for a screenwriter is populated with imaginary characters, locations, dilemmas, and challenges. And we could maybe use the body to help us think about how we might want to do that mental gymnastics in the, st in the story writing process. So, so let's say this carpet here is, is my landscape, my map of, of my characters. And, and I could become curious about the pacing with which I enter into my imaginative landscape. Is it fast? Is it slow? Uh, the velocity often is really important because when we go slow, we see more. Yeah, so entering into our imaginative landscape in a, in a slow, thoughtful, mindful, intentional way. And as we're walking, you know, we might say, oh, look, here's, here's my, my, my character over here. You know, can we, can we create something that's the character and give ourselves the opportunity to walk around and see the character from, from different dimensions, maybe crouching down to look up at the character? How would a child see that character? What, 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 what would be the movements of the character? Uh, you know, zooming in, zooming out, the helicopter view, not only of the character, but then of the whole piece. And we can train our attention network to do this in a much more intentional way. This is at the heart of, of many mindfulness and meditation practices, is learning how to 
uh, with conscious awareness adjust that lens. And then we might take ourselves and put ourselves into the character. You know, so now we're the character, we're the character looking out at, at the landscape of the story and maybe moving the body. You know, how does my, how does my character move? How does my character step? You know, using the body, is it, does it move like this? You know, does it move like this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> using the body and exploring in a really playful way. And I would say playfulness is a, a kind of secret tip because when we play, the brain is more free to, to explore. Uh, but of course, to play, we need to feel safe. So we need to manage our emotions with the going big, <laughs> going big exercise. What captures our attention? You know, do I just walk past the flower? Or do I notice the flower? Or can I put myself in the, in the position of the flower and, and try to understand what are, what are the movements of, of the flower as it grows, as it connects to the sun, as it connects to the earth. And if we're going too fast, and we've just got a goal in mind, like I need to get this story done and it's gonna look like this, we could just go past the flower, don't we? We don't even notice. Whereas if we can step in with intention and say, okay, my intention is this, I'm open to whatever hits my mind. And I've got that curiosity of a child. Like, oh, look, a pebble. Look, mummy, it's a pebble. <laughs> and mummy's like, let's put that down, it's dirty, you know. Like, oh, look, look at how this leaves fell and how the flower is like this, but the leaves are all around. And why is this one dead and this one is alive? You know. All that information is there for us all the time to inspire us. And it may be that we, we think the character is going this way, we think the story is going this way, we can get into that kind of tunnel vision, like make it happen, make it happen. But if we work with intentions, we're here, we're like, my intention is this. Oh, look, something captured my, t I'm gonna wander off here for a bit. I'm gonna explore over here for a bit. Actually, yeah, that's, that's really gonna make the character richer. Then I come back to my track. I take the next step. I say, okay, what else? Oh, look, that's interesting. I'm gonna get lost a little bit over here. Let me get a little bit lost over here. And I'm taking in more information, getting more ideas. Maybe I get even more lost, bringing it back. And if we're really open to the potentiality which is hard in a modern world where we need to deliver projects and get agreements from, you know, from, from commissioners. But in the real, real full potentiality is the willingness to say, actually, I, th I thought this was the story, but now I see it's here. It's not that. And I think that would be my top tip because, because of the way our human brain is, because of how we are magnetized to our our habits, our patterns, and our biases, it's almost like start with the assumption of it's probably not what you think it's going to be. As a storyteller, even listen to what you're saying is, is scary. I will lose myself. Yes. What do I have to do? Not, not, not to lose myself, but not to be scared, probably. My top catchphrase is enjoy being lost how to stay grounded when we're lost and when how to stay grounded is what is in my really knowing what is in my heart what do i want to say not how am i going to say it who is going to say it what is what is the message from my heart that wants to be expressed and if you know that then being lost is not scary being lost is an exploration of what are the ways that this really wants to be born? As a neuroscientist, how would you analyze the fact that writers without enough experience, mm. they often get completely trapped 
into the fact of writing too early and into what they wrote too early. I would probably say that, that what's happening is that the individual has become personally overly identified with what they think should happen or is happening. So I would say that maybe something is happening in the default mode network, particularly in the frontal lobe of the brain, which is the, is the, is where we hold the narrative of I, where we, where we put together the story of I over time. So also included in the default mode network is the hippocampus, the memory areas. Yeah, so we have this function, which is we, we have to hold our story, otherwise we're not integrated. But the task is to hold it lightly rather than gripping it. And you know maybe you could even go to the body to experiment with gripping versus releasing. Why am I afraid to let go? And it's fear, it's always fear. <laughs> it's pretty much all the time fear. Fear of failure, fear of judgment, fear of getting it wrong, fear of losing the amazing idea. And you know, the brain is kind of clinging onto that for dear life because it doesn't want to feel afraid. So in martial arts, we have a lot of exercises where we deliberately create fear. So whether that's training with a blindfold, for example, yeah, you know, fighting with a blindfold, it's really scary. I mean, again, nothing really bad is gonna happen to you because your teacher is there and your colleagues are there, but you feel fear. It's practice in feeling fear. What our society needs now is that return to the earth and to the body and to the mess and uncertainty <laughs> of the body. I mean, it is a scary place. If you've lived in your head, the body is very scary and difficult because it's all these things and we don't quite have the words for it. As somebody who's been spending years studying, uh, uh, you know, how the brain works uh, uh, and on the side of pure rationality and uh, uh, how things connect rationally uh, through research, um, what created, what triggered the fact that you found yourselves as a brain scientist, uh, discovering uh, this passion and this bridge that you establish with martial arts? Well, I think the piece of kind of research, I suppose, that most inspired me, the headline is, brains learn best through movement and play. Look at a child. How does the child learn? That is how our brains are organized to learn. That's nature's way for our brain, movement and play. And then, okay, so what movements? Where are there studies of movements or schools of movements that are also informing consciousness and mind and brain? And the martial arts is one of those places. It's not the only place, but it's a place with a particularly rich tradition and philosophy and actually spiritual uh, aspect to it as well. And then I, and then I started playing. <laughs> I started playing, I started exploring, I started sharing. And, you know, when I was explaining or, or trying to help people learn about mindfulness, I said, well, what I need you to do is bring your mind back and they'd be like, bring my mind back. I don't get what you're talking about. What do you mean, bring my mind back? I, I don't know how to do it. So then it's like, okay, let's get up. Are you going to bring it back? Hoo, 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 in a kung fu style? Or option two, let's bring it back in a tai chi style. Now, if the mind space is relatively relaxed and calm, we can all do bring the mind back in a tai chi style. If the mind space is a bit more agitated or less disciplined, we got to bring it back in a Kung Fu style because otherwise <laughs> we'll be trying to focus and the mind will wander away again. So then we play. We play with the movements. We play with the principles. What does it feel like in the body? Okay, now apply it to this more abstract space. 
of mental movements, but it's all movement. <laughs> what do your, your scientific colleagues think of all of what you are telling us? Well, I think for some of them it's, it's difficult to grasp it, L you know, literally to grasp it. I mean, there, is, there has been some work at King's College London with neuroscience students showing that when you get them to play being a neuron uh, and play how the neurons grow and explore the world, their knowledge is more similar to postdocs and professors compared to the students that just read the book. So we've got research evidence that tells us we need to offer this learning in a different way. But the systems are quite moribound. They're quite conditioned. And they get a bit frightened to really be creative. I mean, I try my best. Um, but even, you know, asking a group of people, before I give a presentation, I might say, let's just roll the shoulders, everybody because I know you've been at your computer all day, let's roll the shoulders. People are embarrassed to move their bodies. They get, they get really concerned about moving in public. And I think, I, yeah, we need to get over that. So I think some of them think I'm a bit mad, <laughs> but I'm embracing that because I'm really confident. I, I see that it works, I, it's backed by the research, and. I really believe we, we need to do it differently. Thank you. <laughs>